Yeah, you have a card, uh, Spal to Kodi, Thrasen and Atira, Nocht. Uh, welcome everyone to Thrasen and Atira. Tonight, uh, we have John Birmingham talking to us about Charles J. Kickham and his people. And um, thank you to Sean Fox for arranging this lecture tonight. Uh, first, before I forget, a little housekeeping. Um, so the lectures for the rest of the week. Tomorrow night we have Monastic Ireland by Dr. Therese Cullen and on Friday we have Belfast in the summer of 1969 by Sean Murray. Uh, so back to tonight's lecturer. Um, John Birmingham was born and reared at the end of a boreen in Mulnahone and has lived almost all of his life beside the Anor at the foot of Slieve Naman. And I'm so glad I managed not to burst into song on that bit. Uh, there are places, these are all places closely associated with Charles Kickham and um, of which he wrote um, so much about. John has a keen interest in the history of the people and the places of his local area, just like Charles Kickham did. And since renovating his old farmhouse where he was born, John and his wife Monica have welcomed guests for over, uh, from over 50 countries to Crokinore. Uh, many of these people are the descendants of Mulnahone emigrants who have come to trace their roots. John and Monica have helped many of them reconnect with the land of their forefathers. Uh, they've also hosted over 100 concerts in their intimate theatre. Um, and John and his family uh, have a, have, uh, sorry, John, John and his family have a big role uh, with music and uh, he enjoys playing the guitar with his son, Sean, and Kilkenny bass band, Real to Real. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, John, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you for the nice introduction. And uh, thanks to Liam for inviting me to uh, give this lecture, my first ever lecture. Uh, might I add, I've stood in front of people introducing them for concerts and different things, but uh, never quite uh, done this. And uh, thanks to, uh, thanks or no thanks to Sean Fox, my old neighbour, for lining this up. Uh, we'll see how it goes. But um, I suppose to give a little bit of background, uh, like Neve said, I've grown up in Mullinahone, the end of a Bori, and spent all my life mostly here. Uh, and my main interest in Kicken is, I suppose, chiefly because he he wrote about the places that I see every day. I, I'm looking out at Sleeve Naman now. I live 200 yards from the River Anor. Um, everything about the past and what Kikim wrote is, is central to my life and has been central to my life. And I suppose the, strangely enough, when we were going to school, I don't remember being taught anything about Kikim in national school. He, I don't remember being told anything about local history uh, at all, really. We, and, and I was never particularly interested in battles and wars in far-flung fields. And uh, I, I gave up in history in junior search. I didn't continue with history. And it's only years later I became very interested in local history, local people, and the people who lived in the area. And I suppose that, that has widened a bit by, like me, me have said, when we renovated the old farmhouse, we started to welcome people from all over the world, and particularly people who had roots in the area, people whose ancestors long, long gone from Mullinahon gone from all on our own at the time of Kikin. And uh, I suppose going back to knowing about Kikin, joined Faroiga, which was then Makran Tua, and uh, Sheila Foley, the leader of Makran Tua, had a great interest in Kikin, and she had, I suppose, been passionate about the writings of James Marr and the local man who had put a lot of Kikin's work together. And my first ever time to appear on stage was I was supposed to sing Patrick Sheehan in the hall in Kilosti and I got so terrified I dragged another fellow onto the stage to sing it with me and neither of us knew it so the thing ended up in a complete disaster which I'm hoping tonight's uh, trip into kick and country won't so we'll do the best we can and I suppose the big then after that then 1982 the kick and centenary was big celebrations here and the community got together and there was huge events organized to celebrate Kicken, to, to remember him. It's the first time ever his house was open to the public. And I suppose we got to know the man who had been a kind of a mythical figure. And the president was down, there was all sorts of events. And before that, there was a committee put together to um, put a booklet together. And they put a thing out to know, has anybody in the area written anything or so, I remember I had scribbled a few things, I don't know if you'd even call them poems, but 
I went over to the local, he had been my father's teacher, Joe Lawrence, and I had handwritten these things long before computers. And um, so I wrote a couple of things. And one of the poems I wrote was about kicking. And I called it His Valley Still. And this is a long, long time ago. So you wouldn't want to be, uh, I'm looking at my friend Frank Callery there. You wouldn't want to be judging this in the poetry competition because I don't know how it scans it. But anyway, whatever way it goes, I want to start off with this. And this is called His Valley Still. And this was from this, this book here. Can you see my second yeah. screen? And, uh, so it's called His Valley Still. When by your banks I walk a while, the sun it softly shines. Lilies of the valley bloom in sweetly scented rhymes. Ripples roll o'er worn wares of pebbles edged in gold. Time has flown so evenly, if not but years grow old. Beyond the fields and hedges wild, the boring winds along. Through your valley of valleys, on torch leave them on. She rises to the heavens, dips to rise again. A silhouette in even time, the sun sinks in the glen. When on her woodland paths I roam to breathe the mountain air, I seem to feel a presence. Who is that goes there? No answer save the rustling leaves, yet his spirit still remains to nestle in the foothills and sunlit verdant plains. So I was excited to have that in a book. Thought I was great and thought that was uh, going to launch my career. And uh, in the inside page here, Ricky Sheehan, who was the secretary, I think, at the time, he said, to John, who in this volume joined the ranks of the poets of Knock Nagel, may you long continue with the task begun. I'm not sure if I've had a poem printed in anything since, but this is it. So we were, we were glad to get there. Uh, so we're moving on to a little bit about Kicken himself. Uh, so who was Charles Kicken? And we know this figure with these glasses, the long beard, and but I suppose not a huge amount the amount amount the about the man. But I'm going to read a little bit from this this pamphlet, which was done in 1903, and it just gives you a little bit of background. And it said, Charles Joseph Kicken, poet of the people, patriot of an exalted type, and perhaps the most truly Irish novelist the world has known came of a respectable and patriotic Tipperary family. He was born in Mulmahone in 1828. He actually was born in a place in Mokler City near Cashel, but that's where his mother came from. But uh, the honour flows past the town and glorious Leaven Amon raises its heather crowned head not far away. His father, John Kickham, had a large drapery establishment in that place and was highly respected by all his neighbours. Charles Kickham receives his education at home under a tutor whom his father, who early discovered the boy's rare talents, specially employed to instruct him. He had been originally intended for the medical profession, but an unfortunate accident put an end to all hope of following it. One evening when he had returned from a day's shooting, in the course of which he had received a severe wetting, he placed before the fire the contents of his powder flask, which got damp. While examining, a spark from the fire caused it to explode, with the result that he was so seriously injured that he was taught for a time that he'd be blind for life. This was not so, but his vision and hearing were for the rest of his life very imperfect. That's, that's the start of it. And then at the age of 18, he commenced his literary career, had some poetry published, and his political involvement quickly followed. Uh, he was influenced by Davis, Duffy, Mangan, Mitchell, became the leading spirit in the Mullinahone Confederate Club, devoted himself to literary work, but also threw himself into, I suppose, everything to do with republicanism at the time. In 1860, he took the Fenian Oath, and he continued on September, going fast forward, we'll come back on a bit of this after, 1863, the Irish People newspaper was started by James Stevens to advocate Fenian views. Keegan was placed on the staff, being joint editor with John O'Leary and Thomas Clark Luby. So that's just a little pen picture of Keegan. And he, so literary work, political work combined, I suppose. But I, I think here really, he's probably remembered or thought of more for the literary stuff than the political stuff at this stage, even though everything says all the monuments and all that. But, but that's probably here is probably best thought of for Sleeping Them On and a few songs. But that's where he goes with, with. so we're going to, Shani's done all the technical stuff. So we're going to show you the house where he, uh, I think that's what's coming next. Um, 
So this is the house where Kaitlin grew up in Feather Street in Moorna Hall and uh, lived there a lot of his life. I wasn't as aware that he spent so much of his time in Dublin, but he did in later years spend a lot of his time in Dublin. This is the house where he was born and grew up. And this is in Feathered Street in Mona Home. And probably on the only time when people could get to see this house was in 1982 for the centenary and they turned it into a little museum uh, of kicking with. So that was fascinating. And I suppose that, that encouraged and that enthused people about the a uh, little more about him and to know more about him when we could see the house and see where it came from. So that's in Feathered Street and it's actually for sale at the moment. So that monument was uh, built in uh, 1982 for the centenary and was, that's just opposite the church in Mona Hall and uh, it's done by four local men. And uh, my family connection, I suppose, with the Kicken uh, is an interesting one too. The 1928 Kicking Centenary Committee, uh, an august bunch of gentlemen all be suited with ties on them. But in the front row, uh, third from the left, that's my grandfather, also John Birmingham. And uh, my uncle Jim wrote a little bit about his father, who he said that he was very interested in poetry. And up to the day he died, he could recite poetry from different poets. So that's why he's on that committee. So 1928, so it's an interesting connection. Then the next one, the 1982 uh, Centenary Committee has my mother on it. And that's her there, still going strong at 98 years old. She's on the 1982 one. And then coming on to the next one, that's me on the present one. And that's in a discussion we had a few years ago in my home with Mary Wilson, a friend of mine who was in school with me. And Mary chaired a panel discussion on is rural Ireland dead? So my argument at the time was, no, it wasn't, but it was up to rural people themselves to keep it alive and not going with the common grain, I suppose, that everything was Dublin's fault. Long before a pandemic, we couldn't have seen anything like this happening. So this is a test for everyone, I suppose. And uh, for the last few year, years, we've hosted the Kicken uh, Country Weekend poetry reading down here in our place. And that's a lovely sunny day where a lot of people gather to, to read their poetry and to enjoy, I suppose, just being listening to each other's readings. It's, bit, it's all lighthearted, nothing, nothing very serious about it. Another interesting one coming up, uh, Not Nago, Kickham's most famous novel, um, was, was turned into a film, a silent film, uh, one of the first in Ireland. And it was made in 1918 and mostly recorded in Mona Home. And a few years ago, I was contacted by an interesting character, a professor of English in university in Sweden whose great-grandmother, believe it or not, was the leading actress in the film. And what he was trying to do from stills of the film was to identify places where the uh, film was recorded. So we had a fascinating day going around Mulnahone trying to find locations where, and you can see some of them there. Uh, the bottom one is the Matt the Thrasher. Uh, different scenes, all recorded in Mulnahone. You can actually see this online now. Uh, and that's where advances are amazing, given the few years even since then that back then you couldn't. But now you can have a look at it, you can see, and if you look at that drum there, right to that drum, that drum is every year uh, is beaten at midnight mass, or what was midnight mass, uh, Joe O'Gorman. Uh, still, that's the Knock Nagel drum, and it still sounded uh, every year. We're moving on now to, if you have a look at this, this is the Anor, and that's myself and Shani having a swim in the Anor last week in the heat. Freezing cold, but uh, nice when you stay in it. Uh, on the left is the Five Eye Bridge. The Five Eye Bridge is the bridge where Kicken uh, would have started to come near to where we live. That's about a mile from us. And uh, Kicken took a walk. His, his favorite walk was from Mullinahone to Gortine, which is just over the road from us. And uh, back in the day when Kicken, I suppose at the time, had a leisurely enough time of it. He, um, his family were well-to-do, so he was writing about a lot of the people who weren't as well-to-do as him. So I kind of took a kind of a tongue-in-cheek look at Kikin heading off for a walk. And this is a sort of a discourse between himself and his mother. And hoping that Kikin had a sense of humour. I think he did. I'm not sure how much, but he, he did have funny characters in some of his books. So this 
This is my own makeup of kicking heading off for a walk. I'm heading off for a walk, ma'am. I'll be back in time for tea. He's out the road again to sit under that bloody tree. Nothing better to be doing than writing some old fable. Not a notion or bother about putting food upon the table. Master Charles, the people call him, a not peculiar name, for a lad who gads about without a penny to his name. I'd say he has a young one leading him astray. No wonder he's ever praying by night and by day. The one living beside the honour at the foot of Sleeve Naman. She could be the culprit for that God-forsaken song. I am home, ma'am, he uttered, drowned it to the skin. You won't believe who I met or guess where I have been. Oh, Charles, my boy, you're soaking, and I have an idea where you've been. For the credit of the little village, don't get caught like that again. So that's a little sideways glance at uh, Kickham. Which I'm sure, I'm sure. So we're gonna, what we're going to do here now, we're going to take that walk with Kickham. And the walk with Kickham is going to introduce, to introduce us to some local characters, characters that he would have met along the way, and characters who would have inspired the characters in his book, but real people, and they're the real people, I suppose, that I'm uh, fascinated with and by. And uh, so we're, we're, we're leaving the bridge now, and we're heading over across the Anor. And we wanna, the first place we wanna come to is the little house at the top of the Borean, where you turn in the top of the Borean where we live. We grew up calling this Cummins's. And Cummins's was the local carpenter's shop, the local meeting place where all the old fellows used to gather back in Kickham's day. And it would have been the first place he called to on his journeys. And I'm going to read now a little piece from my uncle Jim uh, Birmingham wrote a lot of history when he retired. Some fascinating stuff about growing up here, but also histories of Ireland. So this will give you a little taste of what Cummins's was like and the people Kickham would have met. And it involves kicking as well. So at the top of the boreen that led to our house at Ballycullen, there was a carpenter's shop owned by Ned Cummins. He did the complete job from cutting down the trees, seasoning the timber, to completing the finished product. He made every wooden implement that a farm required. These included gates, doors, wheelbarrows, horses, carts, wheels and all. He had his own sawmill, this was before the advent of engines and electricity. All the work was done by hand and finished with exact precision. Ned lived with his unmarried son and daughter. By this time, his wife was dead. There was a very neat thatched cottage with a door leading into a big workshop. It was an open house. People came in and out during the day and passed the long winter's nights sitting on sugging chairs before a warm column fire. Column was a fuel made from anthracite slack mixed with water and yellow clay and made by hand into balls about the size of a turkey's egg. It burnt like anthracite coal, slow but very hot. The winter nights would be passed playing cards and telling stories. Ned, who at this time was in his 80s, recalled how up to feather in his workshop once a month when Charles Kicking would read to them the newspapers and keep them up to date with the latest political developments in the years before and after the Fenian Rising of 1867. So it's fascinating that the house where Kicken visited and where he read to the people, many of them who couldn't read. And in 1867 was the year Ned Cummins' father died, Richard Cummins. So it was Richard Cummins, his son Ned, and then his son. And last week, Sean, myself, uh, and I like to thank my son Sean for doing all the photography and technical work with this. Uh, we went in to have a look at the inside of Cummins. Cummins has been a place, and this is our good neighbour, John Fox, who gave us a tour of Cummins's. And even though we've passed it all our lives, and I've been in there several times, but it's intriguing to look at the inside. And that's me with John. And I read some of the stuff from my uncle about the Cummins's while we were there. And if you have a look, the, the timber on the roof is made by the Cummins. It's everything there is as it was back then, and you can just imagine Cummins com or, or Kicken coming in the door. And there's also lots of writing, and if you look closely there, on the, the one on the top left is 
is a pencil drawing of a revolver. I'm not sure what the significance of it is, but it could have a, a lot of significance. Uh, down on the other one then, there's lots of sketches and drawings of uh, measurements, custom wheels, all sorts of things that they made for the locals. A fascinating place. I'd like to thank John for giving us the tour and showing us, showing us through it. Uh, I'm just going to... The, just another, just one more bit on the um, Pomances and give you an idea of, and I call this Romance on the Boreen. Long before, this is the romance, uh, long before normal people. This is Ned Cummins' daughter, had a romance for her lifetime. She was catty and uh, this is just a little flavour of what it was like back then. Catty at this time was in her early 40s and kept a good clean house for Jimmy and her father. At that time, Catty had been doing a line with the man for about 20 years. John came from the far side of Grange Mokler three times a week to meet Catty. He never came into the house while Ned was alive. They spent the winter nights in the hay barn. John cycled home in the small hours of the morning. After Ned died, John came into the house every night on arrival. They sat at the fire, talked with any callers like ourselves, smoked cigarettes and drank tea. Around 10 o'clock, Catty would politely remark to Jimmy, her brother, anyone could do your business here now, Jimmy, which was the signal for Jimmy to vacate the place and give Catty and John a little bit of space. But they weren't getting an awful lot of space because Jimmy was sleeping in the loft upstairs. So everyone left. John and Catty continued their romance and continued it. And one day, one of them said to the other, wouldn't, wouldn't it be time that we thought of getting married? And Catty said to John, who would marry either of us now? So their romance went on that long and they never did get married. So that's Cummins, and we're going down the road to meet some more characters. And if you look at the next one here, and thanks to John for the tour, uh, this next one here is a story that's fascinated me for a long time. Just up the road from us is a field known as Carney's Inch. And the field is known as Carney's Inch. Didn't know much more about them, only that, that Carney's Inch and the Inch is the name of a field given to a field along the river, the Inch for Ireland from Irish. And the field behind them is the High Garden. So Carney's Inch and the High Garden was pretty much about all I knew. And this is before you had Google or internet. And if you look closely up on the right one is the remains of a house, just the stone of a wall. And it was Carney's house. And again, didn't know much more than that, the track to their house and then the stones. And I wondered what had happened to them. And when Mick Larkin brought out the Mulnahan history book, I wrote a piece for it called, What's in a Name? And I wrote about the Hawes. Hawes were the name of the people who lived where we live now. My, our grandparents came here in 1922, bought it from people called Hall. And this just gives you a flavor of the people who lived in the area and long since gone. There's a field in Ballycullen called Carney's Inch, a hill on the way to Mullinahone called Costello's Height, and a turn for Bally David known as Burns Cross. The names and other like them have survived long after the demise of the people who spawned them. A modern machine can wipe out centuries old remains in seconds and with it valuable clues to the past. Carney's Inch is a no man's land near the River Anner but a clearly marked plot where a house once stood. Nobody knew anything of the family, but a trawl through records yielded a list of people who lived in Ballycullen in 1851. One of them was Gregory Carney. He, like countless others, probably left the country in search of a better life than that which a small holding in Mullinahone could offer in the years after the famine. Down the road from Carney's is a shed called Hall's Barn. Long after the last hall left, the barn still retains their name. Over a 12 year period from 1876 to 1888, six of the Hall family left the same house at the end of the Boreen to take the emigrant ship to Australia. Before they left, many of them carved their names into the walls of the barn. None of them would ever see those marks again. 130 years after she left Ireland, Ellen Hall's grandson, John Galpin, 
returned to trace the footsteps of his grandmother, to run his fingers through the tracks on the wall where his ancestors said goodbye. One of the Ha descendants in Australia calls his house Belly Cullen, a tribute to the people and their place of origin. They took the name to a new land, but part of them remained in the barn at home. Gregory Carney left no such mark. A clump of bushes marks the spot where he tiled. Maybe he left with his neighbours the Haws, travelled by cart to collect the costlows and burns, leaving behind forever their hill, their barn and their cross. I didn't know at that time anything more about the Carneys. And this fascinating, a few years ago, thanks to Google and the internet, I was searching and this was an incredible discovery to discover a man who is buried in a place in Pittsfield, uh, American, and that's in Massachusetts. And it's Henry Carney, born January the 2nd, 1828, the same year as Kicken, in the same parish. Died March the 20th, 1883, just six months after Kicken. And what's fascinating about this, this man wanted people to know where he came from. And it says, native of Ballycullen in the parish of Mullinahon, Tipperary, Ireland. This is a man who left a little field uh, and we saw the little few stones of the house. And what fascinates me is how this man went. And within that many years there has such a monument to his name. I'd love to know how, but fascinating to know that. And that links the counties. Down here is Hawes. This is where we are. This is the house we restored uh, a few years ago. And this is where we bring guests from all over the world. And the Hawes were descendants from French Huguenots, came here from Wine Gap in Kilkenny over 200 years ago. And two of the brothers, uh, I suppose these are the type of people relate, relate back relating to Kikim. Kikim wrote of the tenant farmer, the smaller farmer, the small landholder. Carneys had about 15 acres each. So very small and rare, big families. And you're looking here at Hawes, you're looking at Slevenamon, where Kikim wrote about and so the one on the front corner, even a hundred years after the Hawes left, we still call that Hawes Barn. The yard with the tree, we still call it Hawes Yard. So they're, they're imprinted on it. And here is, if you look at this one here, this is a lease in this place from in 1858 from Matthew Hall and Richard Hall. And they leased it from, uh, William Bryan, who is coming up next. But this one here, if you look, this, we discovered when we renovated the place, I had never seen this before, but this is WH 1863. This is William Hall from 1863. And William Hall went to Australia and became a gold miner. And so William Hall went to Australia, called his place in Australia, Ballycullen. Carnies went to uh, Massachusetts, but made sure that whoever passed by knew that this man came from Ballycullen Mullen Hall. And where the, up the road, the Cummins's were uh, carpenters, the Halls were tailors. And this is an original sign done in small, you can't see it as well, but it's, it's, it's cut out little pieces of timbers and it's J. Hall Taylor. And the, the Halls who went to Australia continued to be tailors, seamstresses. So they, they brought the same uh, profession with them. So this is where we hold the ends of music in that. So tying it back to Kicken and the type of people who wrote about the tenant farmer, the, this, this is Reverend William Bryan. Reverend William Bryan was a landlord around here and he was the landlord for everyone in this area. The, house, the farm we have, the, he, was a, he was an amazing character. Not many people knew about this man until we started to research him. Luckily now, uh, a new neighbour of ours has bought uh, Brian's in the last years, uh, Dennis Morris. He was very interested in the history of the place. And this is the area where Kick and Walk to. This is a beautiful alleyway of trees. And these trees were planted by the Brian family. And if you see on the left hand side with the plaque said, that's where Kickham's tree was. Kickham's tree uh, was where Kickham sat and wrote. And he had. Uh, if you see this, this is, an, this is how Kickham's tree second. looked. I'm not sure if you can see this. So that, that's, that's how the tree looked. But unfortunately, it had to be cut down uh, because of disease some years ago. But 
the Bryans, William Bryan was the local minister, the Church of Ireland minister. He was involved in the, the time of the famine, the workhouse, the local relief committee. He was the chairman of that. Uh, amazingly, he had, he had 12 children uh, back in the early 1800s. And William Bryan has no descendants. And that we follow on with that later on. But he, he was the landlord all in, in that small, literally within a half a mile. This is just over the road from Cummins, and this cottage looks exactly the same now as it did in Kicking's Day. And this is Brett's, and Brett's are the ancestors of Rena, uh, my neighbour John's wife. And Brett's house here was uh, part of Brian's estate, and this house was occupied by uh, a worker on the farm. And even coming up to the later census, the Brett man is described as a shepherd. So he would, have, he would have reared a big family in, in this house. And following on from that, the interesting thing about this is where the, the, the great, great grandparents of uh, Owen and Paul Kelly, the hurlers, the Morans from Limerick, and Noel Fox, who went on to play rugby for Ireland, all came from this little house. And this is, tells you a little bit about William Bryan, and it's the Relief Committee. And it's the chairman of the Relief Committee, Reverend William Bryan writing about the list of landlords, clergymen who subscribe and paid towards the poor, infirm, and well in the home locally. This was a terrible time uh, during the famine when the, we were in the Callan Union, poor law union for the, for the workhouse and people, the, the population was decimated at the time. And this gives, William Bryan comes across as a good man here. He was a landlord, but he did his best for people. And this is, the soup kitchen in Mullen Home. And the interesting connection here between Kikim and the soup kitchen, or between Brian and the, the soup kitchen, if you read down here, I'm in hopes that a soup kitchen may be established in Mullen Home, considering the extent of the district and the few resident proprietors. I think this place is one of those remote districts which ought to be considered more with reference to the amount of destitution than to the sum subscribed. A benevolent shopkeeper, Mr. Kicken, has lent a house gratis for three months for a kitchen. So the house lent for the soup kitchen was given by Charles Kicken's father. So, and they were both on the same committee. Uh, Kicken and Brian were on the committee. And I'm just going to read something which gives an idea of what the, and this is from a book that was brought out about the history of the workhouse in Callan. And it's from Richard McCormick, Farmer and Hubbard who was a big farmer at the time, when asked the following question, replied, where do the labourers who, who work on farms generally reside? In miserable huts on the farm on the side of the road. What is the condition of the labouring population of Mullen Hall? Very bad indeed and wretched beyond all description. I witnessed more misery than I ever thought existed all over the world. The condition of admittance to workhouses caused much consternation and resentment. The scene of parental desperation is given poignant expression in the work of Kicken. The novels Not McGow and Sally Kavanagh describe the scenes of separation, which were the precursor to a subsequent life of toil, death or emigration for those fortunate to have survived the rigours of the workhouse. Desperate as it sounds, many people did survive and went on to make lives away. And there's one interesting, there's a book, I'm not sure if it's out or coming out, written by a man called Power, who's from Paula Capel in Mullana Home. And he spent his early years in the workhouse in Callan. And he wrote about that experience. And he went to America and became very successful afterwards. But he writes of that experience. And that's a book well worth watching out for. So just coming on to, again, the relief, uh, famine relief, where you had the soup kitchen provided by Kicken. Mullinahone Relief Committee subscriptions, Reverend William Bryan, three pounds, you can come down here. Uh, James Kicken, John Kicken, all involved in this, all helping out. But it also shows that the Kickens were, you know, they were, they were of a, a wealthier people, I suppose. And that in turn did give Charles the, the opportunity to not have to get out there and hustle like other people. The sad fact of this is, uh, William Bryan, very prominent clergyman, big family. Uh, Dennis, uh, who lives in Gortine now in Bryan's place, Dennis and myself spent probably a half an hour with a slash and a spade last year trying to find the final place 
of William Bryan. And it's overgrown and it's, it's something very poignant about it. Uh, that this, this is the man's resting place and it's in uh, Kivemon graveyard. If you look there, pre-Norman place, very, very old uh, graveyard. And Charles Kickham's grandparents are buried in this graveyard as well. Uh, if you ever get down to Mulholland, well worth a visit. And uh, this one here is a letter from Kicken to O'Donovan Rosser. And one of the things about uh, Kicken's later years, when we celebrate people and we look back on the past and we think they were great and they all had interesting lives, Kicken's life was marred by disability, I suppose. He, he had, you know, he came from comfort in one way. He had terrible difficulties from his disabilities. But this, this letter here is one from Kicken to Donovan Ross and the Athenians, and it shows the situation he was in in 1876, which wasn't great and makes tough reading. If I could get some money without too much greater sacrifice, I wouldn't sacrifice principle to save me from starvation. It would be a godsend to me under the present circumstances. Besides the unconscious humiliation which a little money got by earnest, honest work might spare me. The work itself, if I can physically be equal to it, had to do with people who would treat me decently. It would probably help me bear up against an accumulation of troubles, which at times I fear will prove too much for me. The most crushing of these troubles is the parting with my two nieces. I defy you to imagine if they leave. Kicken's two nieces went to America. And I'm going to go back on a piece that I got, which includes them. And that shows a tough, tough time that he was having towards the end. But I'm going to go back to when, you know, what was he like? What did he look like? And this was given to me a few years ago by Jimmy Roach, a Clunian man who was very interested in history and had a handwritten huge amount of stuff. And it's, it's a resident in Clunian district who went to school in Dryan Convent, relates the following incident. One day while we were all at work, a gentleman entered and was greeted in a very friendly manner by nuns and pupils. I was young and amazed to see some of my class making some signs with their fingers and he smiling back answering them. Full of curiosity, I whispered to my little fellow worker, who was that? And she answered, Charles Kickham from on home. He being deaf had to use the hand signs. And I too soon learned the working of that system from the other pupils. We read from the pen of Miss Rose Cavanagh that Charles was never happy as when playing with children. He loved to be with them. And when asked what he missed most in prison, children, women and fires, he said. It delighted him when the little ones tried to talk to him on their fingers. And he was patient in teaching them taking particular care not to allow them to speak incorrectly. Children who loved him played about his feet in the sunshine when the stroke of paralysis came upon him at the last. Charles Kickham seemed to be a fairly tall man with dark hair brushed back in curls and waves. His beard was flecked with gray and dark brown in color. His coat of tweed, pepper and salt was of the outdoor sporting type. While he wore a tie, which to me had a pattern somewhat like peacock's feathers. His hat was in the soft tweed variety and coiled around it were casts attached to it, which were many colored fishing flies. He came to see his two little nieces, Josie and Annie, and spent a while playing with them. It gives you a, a kind of a color of the man and what he looked like and how nice he was and how gentle he was. And this comes, the follow on to this is this is a book that, written by a woman from Clonine, H. Newman, who's written Memories from 1900. I'm just going to read a short piece again, which the following poems were impressions which were pictured on the writer's mind after she had lost her sight. It's called, let's see, and there's, there's one here, and it's the Remembrance of C.J. Kicken at Dragon School. So it's the same woman who wrote that piece. And this wouldn't be really known either. Away on memory's distant hills, one peak shines clear and bright, on which forgetfulness ne'er cast a cloud to dim its light. It holds a relic of the past of childhood days long gone, a memory of the gentle face of the poet of Slievenamon. 
Now gazing on that distant scene, I feel a child once more. And when by Sister Gertrude led, I crossed the schoolroom floor. With smiles, she took me on to where two other children sat. She bade us play around the room and look at this or that. We gazed in childhood wonder, round at globes and maps and balls. It seemed as if some fairy tale to tread enchanted halls. Our circuit had not ended when the glass door opened wide. Here's Uncle Charles, Josie said. Run, I'll be first, she cried. He took us out among the flowers, tossed cherries in the air. All had a scramble on the ground. He, laughing, took his share. In after years, my fancy loved to think those cherries rich by him in Nocknagow were plucked of Matt the Thrasher's ditch. In chasing through the garden paths, his hat with branches struck, while fetching it a fishing hook in Annie's finger stuck. Upon his brow a mother's love, an angel's pity shone, as tender that wee finger was by the poet of Sleeve Naman. Nor did I dream a laurel crown decked him who deigned to play, or how my grateful heart would prize the memory of that day. In later years I understood how as I smiled or wept, into his writings, prose or verse, his very soul had crept. Magnificent Tipper or Tipperary, if alone it gave him birth, whose portraits true of its fair homes are scattered o'er the earth. For Irishmen in every clime, the light of God shines on, with love and pride of kick and speak, poet of Sleeve Naman. His orphan niece is well beloved, soon wandered far away. Now winsome Josie sleeps, alas, for I neath alien clay. And gentle Annie's thoughts may have been memory's fond still roam. The prats she trod in childhood days around her Irish home. Tis night and yonder shines the moon behind his own beloved hill. It rays lights up fair Anna's stream, the steep of the mill. Farewell a while to visions bright of days long past and gone. From heaven our patriot poet smiles, poet smiles on moonlit sleep in the morning. No, I'm, I'm, I'm looking out on sleep in the morning as we speak, and I suppose that's what brings it uh, pretty close to us, uh, that we're living where, living where Kick and... Um, Are you sure? Yeah. Living, living where Kick and... Uh, Wrote his, that's, so that's the letter from. Now we're coming on a little more forward. This is a couple of years back at the Kickham weekend. Uh, it was a walk by the Kickham walkers. Uh, and again, Kickham's name is on a few things locally. He's naming on uh, CJ Kickham's, the GA, Kickham walkers, Kickham place in Mulnahorn, the Kickham barracks in Clonmel. And there's an interesting one we'll show later. But th these are a bunch of walkers who followed uh, in the footsteps of Kickham from. Uh, Mullen home to Gorty into the tree a couple of years ago. And uh, on the way to the uh, tree, they stopped at the Mullen home co op, and a very interesting talk was given by a friend of mine, Jim White, who spoke of the history of Mullen home co op, one of the oldest co ops in the country. And then we went on to the site of the tree. And uh, Bridget spoke a little bit about Kikim, and then I spoke about the Bryans. And it was the first time the Bryans, you know, the Bryans had come into the picture, I suppose, and we wanted to mark the people who planted these trees and left us this beautiful alleyway. And so we sang a few songs and while we were singing Sleep in the Mom, spontaneously, people started to dance. And it was a great occasion and it was, a, it was something joyous about it. And following on from that, uh, the next day, I had a phone call from Jim White, the guy on the right, that's me in the middle, and that's Dennis Morrissey on the left. And Jim thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could honour the Bryans in some way? And we thought, yeah, that's a nice idea. We put some mark there. So we got together, the three of us, to see what, what ideas might we have or throw about. And we thought, okay, let's uh, tidy up the area a bit. Let's make it look a little bit better where people might stop. And we started to contact people who we could bring on board. And the guy leaning against the tree is a Tigers Forestry Advisor, Michael Summers. Michael is not only a forestry advisor, he's passionate about everything to do with heritage and history and local things. So we told Michael our idea a little bit and he said, you know, he said, this tree across from where Kickham Street was is perfectly healthy 200 year old ash. 
And this area here is all the, the ash is decimated with ash dieback disease. And I have forestry here and most of the ash has dieback. And he thought, how have we a 200 year old tree that doesn't have it? Maybe we could uh, grow a new tree from this one. Maybe we could do something for the area, for the country, for the timber industry by finding a way to produce ash that doesn't succumb to this disease. So Michael told us that you could take some of the shoots from this tree and try to grow new ones. And we were flabbergasted by this, but Michael suggested this and we thought, okay, these things are gonna to have to be paid for. So Jim got to work on contacting people. He's a good man to find people who pay for things. So Tigers came on board and agreed to fund one part of it. The Heritage Council came on board to fund another part. And the, we took on three phases then. And the first phase was to get uh, an expert hedge layer in. We got Neil Donnelly in to lay the hedge. And where we were sitting there, uh, just behind you, you couldn't see the mountain for years. And when Neil came, he said, I can't see the mountain. And we hadn't thought of that. So he laid the hedge there and all of a sudden you can see the mountain again. And then the Heritage Council came on board and we also got uh, Michael Berkeley from FBD Trust. And when he came out and had a look at the place, he said, this place could do with a good tidy up. So, so slowly the idea and the project we had was taking a life of its own that we didn't realize. And then we have a project uh, gone ahead that's, um, and if you look at the guys high up on the right, that's taking shoots of the 200 year, year old ash tree and hoping to grow them over maybe a three year period and produce a new uh, kickums tree, which we will plant uh, across the road and uh, see what happens. Now we're coming on to another sad part. Uh, Kickham, he was a writer, he was everything, but you can now find people's death records online. So here's the death start of Charles, and it says Charles James Kicking, but it's, it's Charles Kicking. Bachelor of 53 years, and what surprised me was he's listed as having no occupation. So, and that ties in, I suppose, with how difficult his life was towards the end. You know, it wasn't an easy place for him to be. You can see uh, what, he, what he died of there. And I'm just, while we're looking at that, I want to read a little bit from a book that, uh, on the Fenians, that I've done a lot of reading on this just to get some feel of it. And you know, when you research things, you end up reading more than you need to and you find other things out. But this is a little bit on the Fenians. And Fenian Brotherhood aimed to overthrow British rule in Ireland by armed insurrection. In 1865, Keegan wrote an editorial on priests in politics, which advised priests to stay out of politics and called for revolution. Our beautiful and fruitful land will become a grazing farm for the foreigners' cattle. And the remnant of our race, wanderers and outcasts, all over the world, if English rule in Ireland be not struck down. He was convinced that parliamentary politics was a waste of time. After the failure of the Tenant Right League, he lost faith, faith in political agitation and became more radical. So a guy who was, you know, from the description of him there going to the school, a very gentle person, he obviously, you know, when he took the pen in hand, he could deliver it. He was imprisoned for treason, felony, which is an overt act to depose or levy war against the sovereign, to compel changes of policy or to intimidate or overthrow parliament. So pretty serious charges. So fragile Kickham's health collapsed during his incarceration. And his abuse at the hands of his captors was raised in Parliament in 1867. He was held in solitary confinement in Pentonville and then transferred to Woking, released in 1869, almost blind. Kicken, who had never really done any physical work in his life or had to or able to, Kicken was unable to use his right arm because of an abscess and was forced to sit with his fellow prisoners on a heap of rubble in the November cold and fog and break up stones and bricks with his left hand. He returned to his cell at night and had nothing to eat but six ounces of bread and a pint of hot water. And Joe Ambrose in the Fenian Anthology says that it was their involvement with the Irish people which indirectly destroyed the lives of quite a few leading Fenians. He also says that Kicken was one of the few proper writers that they could rely on. And Kicken agreed with Franciscan Luke Wadding who wrote, Time was when we had wooden chalices and golden priests. 
Now we have golden chalices and wooden priests. Another link that uh, links family-wise to Picken, uh, to our family, and I've been trying, tracking it, is my great-great-grandmother, my mother's great-grandmother, uh, was born in Ballingarry in 1828, a woman called Ellen Dunn, born in the same year as Kicken. And my grandmother's first cousin became the Archbishop of Cardiff. And I have a five, six-page letter that he sent to my mother back in the early 50s, when he was in his 70s. And uh, what's incredible about it is he could go back on the generations. And uh, Ellen Dunn, my great-great-grandmother, who was born uh, the same year as Kicken, you generally won't be able to find any information on people from that time. But this man went back so far. Here's what he wrote, part of what he wrote. Um, here he refers to Ellen Dunn, my great-great-grandmother, who was born in 1828, the same year as Kicken. I very greatly loved your great-grandmother Ellen Dunn of Ballingarry and her tales of the sights she saw. Daniel O'Connell speechifying at Ballingarry, old Queen Victoria, whom she had seen as a young girl on one of her visits to her rebel Irish subjects. The fight of the Young Islanders in 1848, and she teaching me my prayers in Irish. Women like her were the great factors which made the glorious Ireland of the ages and the first type we have so few alas in these far more worldly times. They were the more worldly times of the 40s. Not sure what he's making now, but it's, it's fascinating that here links uh, one of my ancestors who was born the same year as Keegan. And another fascinating link is that she went from Ballingarry to, uh, she married a man in Bootstown in Freshford. Her daughter married uh, my great-grandfather in Tullerone. And the woman from Ballingarry took uh, bulbs, flower bulbs from Ballingarry, uh, planted them in Bootstown and Freshford. Her daughter dug up the bulbs from Bootstown and Freshford and, and planted them in Tullerone. And my mother dug some of them up in Tullerone and planted them here. So the narcissus and daffodil bulbs that grow here every year actually can go back to then. So we're linking, I suppose, people my family with that time, with Kicken's time, linking my, my grandfather was four years old when uh, uh, Kicken was born, went on to be on that uh, committee. So lots of links, uh, lots of people linking them to it. And we now have, I suppose, brought in different people, the people who we would have written about, the people from all levels of society, uh, the people who colored his books, one of the things, if you read Not Nagao, which amazed me, was that a lot of the language in Not Nagao, some of it is still used by locals, but it's used by locals, particularly who never went anywhere, whose parents never left Mulnahone, whose grandparents never left Mulnahone, whose great-grandparents left. Like, one of our neighbours still calls the Boreen the Boshin. And that's what the Boreen was in Kickham's Not Nagao was a Boshin. If my mother wants to tell you to shut up, she'd say, Arawisht. And that's what they said in Not Nagao, if they wanted you to stay quiet, Arawisht. So lots of things linking it, lots of things. So why do we remember them? I suppose we remember Kikim is reaching out through his, through his words. Um, the other people, the Carnies are reaching out through the monuments. They wanted to let you see where they came from. Uh, the Hawes, the same way, called their place Belly Cullen. William Bryan has left us the trees. And we hope, uh, we hope that, you know, that the, what we do over there will uh, honour him and honour the people. And the, uh, so we're moving on from, that's Kickham's grave in the back of the church in the home. Kickham, when he died, had 10,000 people uh, in procession to Houston Station. When he got to uh, Thurless, the coffin wasn't allowed in the cathedral. When he got to Monahon, Kicken was buried without any local clergy there. I suppose he, even though he was, you know, considered himself to be a faithful to his religion, he's, he had antagonized priests in his time, and I suppose that's the way it was with the clergy and being him. So that's, that's his grave. Where were to listen or, or a look? A lovely tribute uh, by Rose Kavanagh. And when we took this photo recently, what jumped out at us was that little, uh, little plaque, little thing up on the there. 
and it was from uh, Ardine GA Club in Belfast. And it's to, uh, they, they traveled from Ardine in Belfast to honor uh, Kicken. And because their club is called after Kicken. And we found a picture the other day where a bunch of cyclists standing at the grave. I hadn't seen that before, but, but it's a lovely one. So that's Kicken's final resting place. Uh, and we're gonna finish here with this. This is, he might have his resting place, but these are the shoots of the new tree. So these are the shoots that we took from the 200 year old tree, uh, thanks to Michael Summers initiative. They have now been planted in uh, this compost, some very technical form of compost. They're being grown by Tagusk, and as you can see, they're doing well. And believe it or not, those shoots, the shoots that you see are 200 years old but they're growing on new, they're, they're going to create a new one. And so we're, we're turning the whole span of Kikin where we're keeping uh, his memory alive. We're gonna keep the brines alive. And so it's a, it's a route that I hope has been of interest to include the people, not just Kikin, but the people he would have met, the people who, who grew up, who I heard about through my father, from my uncle's writings. And, and all the people who link, I suppose, the place to the mountain. Your local, still very, um, but everyone has a local place and everyone has people in their local places who mean a lot to them. And I think we're trying to do just something local over there. And I'd like to thank a few people before I wrap it up. I'd like to thank my friend Frank Callery in uh, Tullahawk for all his help uh, and advice. I was struggling with this, how to go about this. And uh, I can have to Frank, and Frank uh, would always take you out of a hole. I said, Frank, I'm after taking on this, but I don't know how to go about it. Because I thought, no, I'm not going to spend an hour talking about kicking because I don't know enough about it. And I'm not going to read all of the stuff because it can be dry. So Frank came up with the title, Kicking and His People. So about two weeks ago, I wondered how I was going to go about this. And I was struggling with it. And uh, I thought, right, Kicking and His People, let's bring the people in. So the people are, I suppose, part of his story, part of my story. So thanks, Frank, for that, for the inspiration for that. Thanks to Eugene O'Mara, a friend of mine, for giving me some books on the Athenians and everything which I waded through. And I hope nobody asked me any questions about them because you'd get lost in the fog of the middle of it. Uh, to my neighbour, John Fox, for giving us the tour of uh, the Cummins's. Uh, to his son, Shawnee Fox, who apparently was the one who wrote me into this. And uh, suggested this in the first place. And uh, to everybody out there who I hope uh, some of you have uh, tagged along, we, we run concerts here and nobody can get up and leave in the middle of a concert, but you could get up and leave in the middle of this, no bother. So I'm sure some of you have, and that's, I don't mind at all because I'm more than glad uh, to have got through this. Uh, thanks again to Liam and to Niamh and to everyone behind the Trust and the Terra project. It's, it's a wonderful idea. So if, if this is your first time to tune into it, uh, don't let it be your last. Um, I'd like to thank in particular uh, Shawnee, who came on board to do all the photographs, all the everything, because it had been very boring. Well, it could have been boring anyway, but very boring looking and listening to me the whole time without the photographs to give you the, the colour of it. And Shawnee described me recently as being digitally illiterate. And I have no problem at all accepting that uh, moniker. But... I said, I might be digitally illiterate, but at least I can play the guitar. So we're going to sing you out uh, with the Kickham's Anthem. And Shawnee's going to join me on this one. So in your virtual world, uh, we hope you all sing along to uh, Shlieve Naman, the Kickham Anthem. So here we go. And uh, we hope you enjoy bits of it or that some of it was new. And here we go. So you come around here. Here's just some of the publicity we've been getting for the, the tree project. It looks backwards from here. So uh, drive on, keep, keep an eye on it. So here we go. Sing along, sleep in the month. It's a waltz, but we're slowing it down because you can't dance. Alone, all alone, 
by the way it was all alone. All in his name, and the waves stay on the ground, but my heart is alone. Flies far away, by night and by day. To the times and the joys that have gone. And I never will forget Sweet May that I met In the valley she hung Was not grace for queenly her cheeks of roses low her soft dark eyes a flowing hair a was a lily white brown Soul of truth and a melting root and a smile like the summer's dawn that stole my heart away the bright summer's day in the valley. By the star of the shore, I rest still. My love, oh my love, shall I never see you more? My land will never rise. Night and by day, I ever, ever pray, while lonely my life goes on, to see a flag on the my true love to implore in the fire. And I never will forget Sweet maiden I met In the valley she Thanks for singing. <laughs> That's all we on uh, kicking. So... Thanks a lot to everybody who uh, joined in, to everybody who stayed, to uh, everybody who helped out. Uh, Thanks so much, John. That was fantastic. We've got um, a few questions if you've got a few minutes and uh, lots and lots of really good comments here. So I'll read some of them out if you, if you don't mind. Um, I'll start with the questions. Um, Nemo Sullivan says, um, what does John think of our educational system uh, that are, of how our educational system focuses, focuses on national history rather than encouraging children to learn and interpret local history as uh, John, you yourself has, have done. I, I think looking back now, you know, it's I find it incredible that I gave up history. Uh, that is one of the things I'm most interested in now. 
because I just wasn't interested in learning about battles and wars in faraway lands. And not that people can't be interested in that, or that's the field. But, but I would have loved to hear more about uh, uh, local history. I would have loved to know more about Keegan. I would have loved to know that uh, it was years later when I discovered, until my uncle started to write books that my own name, Birmingham, that we came with the Normans. We learned all about the Normans in school, but we never learned about the local families who came with the Normans or where we came from. Or One of the things when I was looking up the research, uh, or I, I know from my uncle's research that we came in with the Normans. Uh, Birmingham is a Norman name. Uh, Keegan came in with Cromwell. Cromwell kicked us out where we were. So I suppose we all have a roundabout way. It wasn't Keegan's fault. He just happened to be the descendant. So it is interesting that um, here I am, the descendant of a Norman, talking about the descendant of a Cromwellian. Uh, but I, I think, yeah, I agree fully with Liam. I would love if local history was uh, an integral part of the uh, education system. A few years ago, when the Kicken uh, weekend was revamped a little, one of the things we did was to, uh, a few of us went to the local national schools just to talk about local history, to talk about Kicken and to talk about places and one of the things the local national school did then was to, um, they took a walk down through the fields and uh, they came up to our place and uh, we all sat in and I told them about what it was like when I was going to school and uh, they, they thought I'd gone to school sometime before the war but uh, probably looked at it. But when I told them, you know, we walked to school, we walked home, we, we met people along the way uh, and not that, you know, it was interesting for them, and I suppose I also told when I when I got the, I got the list of names of the people in the school, and I was able to tell them, you know, my grandfather knew your grandfather, or my father had your father working for him. And it's all local, so yeah, I, I would fully I would love if the education system had a local uh, a local in, uh, part to it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think it would really inspire people, bring it home to them, literally. Um, so um, I have a question then. Um, so. In that report that you quoted during the famine, uh, the poverty in the area of Mullinahone seemed to be a lot worse, uh, particularly bad. Why, why was it um, so particularly bad? Well, most of that information I got, got from this book, it's a fascinating book and it says the famine in this area. I think looking at it, maybe there was huge populations. And I suppose in some ways, maybe the, looking at it, number one, the, the potato crop, it always baffled me that they were only living on potatoes, you know, why didn't they keep a few hens and things? But, you know, you had small people, uh, farmers like the Carneys, who had just very small holdings. They had big families, so it was a struggle to feed them, I'm sure, number one. Mm -hmm. uh, the number of people who ended up, I was astonished to see in that area, the number of paupers, the number of people who ended up in the workhouse from well in a home. But there was also something that really jumped out at me and which isn't a nice thing to say, but some couples abandoned their families in the workhouses, which is a terrible, not many, but there was, I suppose they were in such a situation, they were in terrible uh, straits. If you ended up there in the first place, it, things were pretty dire for you. But I think the population was big, number one, you had big families. So if things went wrong and you couldn't feed your family, and that's not just from all in the home, you were going to be under pressure. And I was, I was astonished to read, that's a great book, The History of the Callan Workhouse and Poor Law Union. And, you know, the relief and to try to, to, you know, you can see by the people who contributed money, the only people who had money to contribute were the Bryans and the Kickhams and, and people like that. So that's why it's sad to find that, uh, that Charles Kickham's people were you know, well to do. He certainly didn't end up well to do, but it's a tough one, but I, I'd recommend if anybody can get that, that's a great, um, that's a great one on the local area here uh, on the famine, yeah. the effect of the famine. Yes, thank you. Um, and uh, another one for, from Sean Brown. Um, was there a specific reason the ash was saved from disease? No, I don't think so. Like I have, I have a lot of forestry here planted, and uh, most of it has uh, ash dieback. And I think when Michael Summers, the tagist uh, forestry man, is always hoping that maybe, we're always kind of hoping that maybe I'm, I'm doing the same, leaving some of the trees in the hope that they will survive it. And 
this tree, it was remarkable when he spotted this tree, uh, literally as old as the original one, and he said, this could be our solution to it. This could be a big solution to the data. So I think pure luck, I don't think there's any particular reason for it. Uh, that's my uneducated answer to that. But it would be great if it works. If this works out, it'll be fantastic. Fantastic, yeah. Um, so just down to the comments now, and I think Colm O'Rourke um, has a beautiful comment, which sums it up for me. This is very enjoyable, he said. Uh, Such passion and detail for a home area. Thanks, John. Uh, I think that is, is just exactly what the, tonight was. It was the passion for home. Um, and like Kikam, you've, you've just brought that across so beautifully. Um, everybody else, Sean Fox says, really enjoying this presentation. John, you are a credit to Knock Nagao. My father is thinking about offering guided tours in Cummins. Well done, and thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and memories. Long may, be the, may they be told near the Anner at the foot of Shivnamon. I'm trying not to sing. <laughs> Um, I think this is your brother, T. Birmingham, listening from Wexford. I must compliment my brother on his fascinating account of the place where I grew up and left some 40 years ago. I think I left my mark on a wall there, just like the halls, though I didn't travel so far. Oh, Wexford's fairly alien. <laughs> um, Michael Moroni, uh, Mahu, John Birmingham, what a store of local knowledge and history. Thank you for preserving and sharing. Uh, Frank Callery, uh, when you mentioned the Callum Workhouse, I was looking at the bell behind you that Monica rang when you, Shawnee, and I recorded the Workhouse Bell in Hall's Barn. You've done Kickham and his people proud. Thank you. Um, Bridget says loud and clear from Paula Capel. Great work, John, from the Forestals. Uh, enjoying the local history of my townland, Arias, says Patsy and so on and so on. So we'll send you all the links uh, to all the comments tomorrow, John, but uh, I think you've wowed everybody and you kept them all online the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. And uh, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, and we'll say good night. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neve, and thanks to everybody for uh, tuning in. Nice to be part of it. Take care.